As you heard, my name is Marcel. <laughs> uh, this is a talk about uh, our work T's, uh, fuzzing trusted applications on commercial off-the-shelf Android devices. And this is joint work with a bunch of other uh, research institutions with all the beautiful people you see listed here on the slide. So before we dive in to like the, the actual system that we built to fuzz, let me give you a little teaser on this. So our phones have become kind of ecosystems where a bunch of stakeholders deploy their software stacks on, right? And a couple of them rely on like their assets being protected. And these systems are exposed to a bunch of threats, like a malicious app being installed, your device simply being stolen, or as we've learned this morning, your basement being hacked from the outside. So and as a second line of defense, manufacturers came up with this idea of a trusted execution environment. So like an isolated context that gives you certain integrity and confidentiality guarantees to keep your biometric identifiers safe, your pin pattern passwords, your crypto keys for your full disk encryption, and like cryptographic key management in general. And since ARM is the dominating like chip uh, like architecture out there, ARM Trust Zone is typically the foundation, the technological foundation for uh, these trusted execution environments. So unfortunately, these services running in these trusted execution environments, also called trusted applications, have bugs themselves, since, for example, they are written in memory unsafe languages. And that makes some of the stakeholders really upset, right? Well, because when you have your... Uh, like payment solution rolled out there and you're relying on these properties, that's not really what you want. And uh, also if you're a streaming provider and your 4K streams are at some point available on someone else's platform just for free, that's also not really what you had in mind for your business model. So let's do something about these um, bugs that we find in these trusted applications and just fuzz all the things that are out there. And this is what this talk is about. We will uh, look at how to write a uh, fuzzer for these services um, in TEs, namely trusted applications. So just a little introduction. I'm a PhD graduate from FAU, that's, uh, that's in Germany, and I'm a postdoc right now at uh, EPFL in the Hexive group led by uh, Professor Paya. I'm cu currently kind of looking for the next uh, thing to do, so if you want to get in touch, reach out. And I've been working on like a bunch of embedded system security, Android and Android trusted execution environments, and uh, fuzzing in particular. So the outline for this talk looks like this. So first I'm going to arm you guys up on like a little bit of background for trusted execution environments, what it means in the ARM context. Then uh, trusted applications, like why would we fuzz them as a little motivation? What are the challenges that we face when we want to do that, especially in an on-device scenario? I'll talk a bit about previous work, the design of our system, TEAS, and the rationale behind it, and I'll show you like a little fuzzing example, and then we'll conclude the talk. So let's look a bit into the background. I think you have seen this, uh, many of you have seen this slide before. What are the privilege levels that you see on a typical ARM uh, architecture? So we have these four privilege levels that you see on the left. They're called exception levels in uh, ARM terminology, and they're enumerated from EL0 to EL3, EL0 being the lowest privilege level, and EL3 the highest. On EL0, you find the user space stack, typically. And then what you're probably not familiar with when you're primarily working on, on x86 is this world split, right? Where three of these privilege levels can typically be separated into different execution modes. One is the normal world execution mode that um, is typically where your software stack, the one that you're familiar with, is running. So on Android, that would be the user space uh, stack and the Linux operating system. And then all the boxes that you see in red here is everything by the by the manufacturer by the by the OEM um, the trusted execution environment? And in this talk, we're primarily interested in what is happening on uh, the the connection between these user space components here, namely the client applications and the trusted applications. They're usually communicating using this um, IPC, the interprocess communication mechanism, but they cannot really talk directly to each other. So technically a lower privilege level needs to turn to a higher privilege level since only the secure monitor that you see at the very bottom here can actually change between these contexts and then um, data is exchanged using uh, shared memory buffers. Okay, So basically everything I'm talking about in the remainder of this um, talk is about this, this layer here, EL0, and the uh, like passing data using this logical IPC channel. To just... Uh, like uh, 
show show like an example how that would look like uh, on on an actual phone. So if you install an app and this app has any sort of requirement, wants to generate a, a key like an RSA key or an AS key, it would turn using the Android framework to the key store daemon, and the key store daemon on behalf of this app would ask the key master trust deprecation now in this user space uh, of the TE to generate a key itself has access to a key encryption key that it usually uses to uh, encrypt a, a key blob that is then uh, returned to the normal world side uh, in an encrypted form, right? So neither the key encryption key or this encrypted key blob are supposed to be ever exposed outside of the TE, and all the cryptographic operations based on these keys are happening inside of this trusted application. So this is where you get your kind of confidentiality uh, guarantees from. So now let's look at the motivation and why are we actually interested in fuzzing these uh, services, right? So first of all, it's a pretty large attack surface. I'll um, give you a little bit more of an intuition about this on the next slide. Then it's a growing and pretty fragmented ecosystem. So if you look at different phones, you will find different TE implementations. And on top of that, different implementations, um, sometimes even multiple implementations of the same thing on the same platform, uh, that are loadable into the trusted execution environment. And typically they're written in uh, memory unsafe languages and that kind of shouts there are a lot of memory corruptions that we can find using uh, an approach like fuzzing. So just to give you an, an intuition about uh, how large this attack surface is, so let's look at some of the trusted applications that we found on a pretty recent model by Samsung, that's the uh, S22, the international version, so you'll find an Exynos chipset on there, uh, which typically runs the, the Tigris uh, TE by Samsung themselves. And if you just look into one of the folders containing all the trusted applications, you'll find that there are like uh, 33 individually loadable blobs, each of them having a bunch of handlers to process like complex data uh, inside of there. And I would argue, yeah, this is this is kind of a large attack surface. And all of that is typically directly accessible from the normal world context. So now you could you could say, oh well, uh, does this stuff actually suffer from vulnerabilities? And uh, just as another intuition here, I wrote a little scraper to just go through Samsung security bulletins and was just filtering for a bunch of keywords related to trusted applications, right? And this is just an excerpt from like the, the most recent ones. And as you can see, yeah, in 2023 and 2022, the stuff still exists. And if you read through some of the descriptions here, you can see that this is actually like the classical memory corruption scenarios. There's also a tendency that these vulnerabilities are typically like in the high to critical uh, severity range, and you find very exotic things here, like an externally controlled format string in 2022. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, kind of funny. So if you go through uh, this this entire uh, advisory, you will find uh, 97 um, vulnerabilities that are related to trusted uh, applications. So, and, uh, I mean, I, I picked Samsung here because they are very, like, open about uh, their advisories, right? That it's no, no, no shaming. Uh, other vendors might want to uh, also live up to the standard to be open about the disclosures. So, um, that was this intuition about, yeah, these classical memory corruptions actually exist in uh, the trusted execution environment. So now, we want, we want to write a fuzzer. And uh, a fuzzer, if you want to deploy it on the, on the device, has a couple of challenges. One of these challenges is definitely the like limited introspection capabilities. Typically, if you fuzz a Linux user space process, let's say, right, you have all the introspection capabilities that you want. You can attach a debugger, you can uh, either instrument the source code or instrument the binary, and uh, get what you typically do in fuzzing, in gray box fuzzing, get the coverage feedback while the target is executing. So, but that, that's not really what you have on a device because you cannot uh, change the trusted application in this setting. So there's very limited introspection. Then all the data is exchanged using these shared memory buffers that are exchanged between uh, the worlds and they have pretty complex input formats, right? So to come up with the formats that actually execute some meaningful log logic is, is, is not trivial. And the third point here, the statefulness. So trusted applications are uh, stateful programs, meaning they have this outer state machine that you, of course, have to have them loaded first. And usually you need to establish some sort of session, but then they have these inner state machines. And you can imagine this as like a file system, right? When you want to 
uh, write to a file, you need to open it first and provide the right file descriptor to actually do something with it, right? And like a similar, similar, um, like statefulness applies to these targets to trusted applications. So a bunch of previous work has already uh, looked into this problem and you know, trusted execution environments and trusted applications are kind of a high value target out there. And I just want to like give you like these, these two axes here about the, the previous work. The vertical axis is uh, on device fuzzing. This usually means it's a black box scenario. And the uh, bottom here is uh, rehosting which basically means that you take some firmware blob and you build an execution environment around it so that it behaves reasonably well, okay? And on the horizontal axis, you have more like general purpose fuzzing where you just populate buffers with more or less random bytes. And then on the right here, you have this trusted application awareness that is kind of aware of, uh, okay, there are these nested state machines and uh, I, I have to take care of very target and trust application specific input formats. And I think the very first one, at least that I saw out there, was uh, by Gal Benamini, who put this Fuzz1 project out there, which was fuzzing uh, the Qualcomm secure execution environment that was um, on-device fuzzing. And then we have a bunch of others um, that yeah, took individual trusted applications or like entire um, operating trusted execution environment operating systems of, of different vendors and try to um, build their, their fuzzers uh, around it. Then there's our work that did not do the rehosting approach. It was just saying, okay, uh, writing emulators for all of these targets in academia, we tend to try to be more general, right? This is going to be a lot of work and I want to be finished with my PhD at some point. So uh, we were decided to do the on-device uh, road. And actually, I'm not aware of, of any fuzzer that actually does the the bottom right here. And that might be uh, an interesting project, interesting next, next project for you. So one project um, that I want to point out is this uh, part emu project that you see here. So this is by uh, Samsung Research. And they actually did a lot of rehosting for a bunch of trusted execution environments. And I actually would have loved uh, to to build my work on on top of that and just do gray box fuzzing plus the stuff we did, right? Because it's kind of an orth orthogonal problem. But, unfo but unfortunately, their uh, prototype was uh, never never released, although it's an academic work. And uh, yeah, it was uh, not officially released, at least. Um, so the let's talk about the design of T's. So the core intuition behind T's is that the trusted execution environment does not exist uh, on its own purpose, right? So usually in the normal world context, you have some client that actually makes use of this stuff. And these client applications uh, in, like, implicitly take care of complex input formats and the, the nested state machines in there. So if we can somehow like leverage the information that is in there, we have uh, solved parts of the problem. And what we can see is that these uh, system services, which are um, like the, the, the client applications, usually are, are layered. There's an outer layer, typically um, interfaced using the binder into process communication mechanism that you find on Android. And then they interface in some vendor-specific components using some client application interfaces. Okay, And at some point, they will interface into the kernel, and there's some, some interesting properties about these interfaces. So the first, the higher you go in these abstraction levels, it's kind of intuitive, but the more semantics you will see, right? So at the bottom level, you see that just buffers are passed around, and at higher level interfaces, you actually see, ah, this is the array of um, parameters that I'm using to generate my RSA key. So I don't know, the mode, the padding, and, and whatnot. So... If you want to have some some idea of what kind of data is actually passed there, it is interesting to look into these upper level interfaces. But on the other side, for for fuzzing, you want to have a lot of control over your input, right? And these client application uh, libraries exposing these interfaces have a lot of sanitization logic in there, so you cannot directly inject your input in there because then it's already your input will already be rejected in the normal world side. So we kind of want to combine the, like the, the the perks of both of these worlds, right? So cap capture like type-rich seeds from these higher-level interfaces, 
but in the end, inject the uh, fuzzed input down at the driver level interface to kind of have a lot of control about what input is actually reaching the trusted application. So having this intuition in mind, let's just look at T's from, from end to end so that you have an overview, and then we go into the different steps uh, in, in this process. So the first one is, so there's no easy enumeration mechanism so that you can just see what kind of client applications are out there. We built a little bit of tooling so that it's easier to kind of uh, figure out what are the client applications actually talking to the trusted execution environment. Having these client applications now, we take their interface descriptions, we parse it, create the abstract syntax tree, and we do two interesting things. One is, from the different parameters, the type parameters that you see in these uh, function descriptions of these interfaces, you can extract uh, like type-aware mutators. I have an example to make more clear what that actually means. And on the other side, we generate something that we call like dynamic binary uh, instrumentation recorders. Right. That's basically a fancy term to say we uh, have a translation from the abstract syntax tree to um, JavaScript in uh, Frida to hook into the functions and uh, scrape individual parameters in an automated fashion from, uh, from memory. So then we have a way to, when we see an interaction with a certain interface, to scrape all of these uh, parameters from, from memory and store them away in a, in a type annotated way that gives us a type and state aware seed corpus that we can, that we can then use uh, for fuzzing. So let's talk about this, this first step, the client application detection. So what we found is typically there's a library that kind of abstracts away <coughs> the, the driver, um, the, the, the driver of the kernel. And if you just kind of backwards resolve the dependencies to this, you will find um, most of the of the services that are making use of that. All right. So this is uh, an example of the, the the key master service and all of its um, all of its libraries that that it uses, and that this usually corresponds to the different abstraction layers. There are, of course, a bunch of other services and. What I meant before when I said we, we hook into these different interfaces is that we hook into uh, the interface that directly talks to the driver. That means we can uh, copy these, these buffers going to the TE. And we want to hook into this upper layer here, which is very semantically rich. We can actually see using um, the, the description of the interface what kind of types are passed. So now I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about hooking into this upper uh, layer interface. So we take the interface description, as I said before, we transform it into the abstract syntax tree, and then we do two things. We generate some uh, DBI code, and we generate some mutators. And here's an example how that might look in practice. So we have a little interface description. This is a function that takes uh, a struct S pointer as an input. The struct S pointer has three members. One of them is this enum that you see here, okay? So then you parse it, you take um, this like clang-like abstract syntax tree, and you can process it to, to generate two things. The one thing is this dynamic binary instrumentation recorder. What that basically does is it has an on-enter hook and an on-leave hook. So when you enter the function, when you leave the function, you can uh, patch some logic that's executed in there. So and let's look at the enter hook here. This logic would traverse the um, x0 register, which is typically the, the first uh, register passed uh, on, on ARM, and scrape the, the contents of this parameter in a type-aware way from memory and store it away for us. So we have a couple of bytes that are uh, like type annotated now. That is very nice uh, to have for, for fuzzing. And on the other side, when you have an enum in your input that you're passing to a target, and it's very like sparsely populated, so it's only x, y, and z, which usually corresponds to uh, like 0, 1, and 2, this is kind of inputs that you want to um, favor, right? So an enum is usually 32 bits in width, and like probing this entire input space 
although only these three values are, are really the ones expected by the target, um, is, is too much. And like favoring these uh, three inputs is, is usually the, the smarter choice. So this is like a simple example for um, a type aware mutator. So now let's look how that looks in practice. So here we have a function that takes two parameters. One is an input uh, parameter and one is an output parameter. The structure of this input parameter here looks like this. So it's a nested struct. And the structure of this output parameter is just um, like, a, like a byte array and its length inside of a struct. So let's look at this uh, p in. It has a length of three and a pointer that points to another region in memory that has, um, according to its structure definition, these three entries. And now we want to use our like DBI recorders to actually get this data out of there. So the, all of that logic is automatically generated. You can hook it into the function and scrape the contents according to their types uh, from memory. And this is what we do for all the input and all the output parameters. And we also do this for the lower level, where you only have byte buffers, right? right? And you don't have any, any sort of types down there. But this is eventually the C that you want to use. And the interesting step is now that we combine these two captures and kind of correlate the information from the higher level to the lower level to have like type enriched uh, seeds that we can later use for fuzzing. And we do this for both sides, the input and the output direction. Now you might ask yourself, why do you do this for the output direction? Well, I was mentioning this challenge of uh, covering the, the statefulness of targets, right? And if you want to do that, one way to, to deal with that is just tracking all the output parameters that are later used as input parameters and kind of establish these value dependencies that you need to exercise the API in a, in a meaningful way. And this is uh, part of what, what we do in, in T's as well. So now I brought you a little uh, example of how this looks in practice. So I already did all the um, client application detection and the seed recording and everything. Now we just want to like you look how, how this fuzzer uh, looks in practice. Um, it's this device here. Uh, it's a very old device from 2016. Um, it's, it's discontinued, and if we find like any any bugs uh, that are not reported yet uh, on stage, it's probably not not really relevant. So what I'm doing here now is um, I will just start the the fuzzer. And how do I make this? So this this uh, this command here just uh, starts the fuzzer, and it will just uh, boot up, connect to the phone send the inputs and then do a bunch of uh, uh, reporting. And on the other thing here, we will attach to the phone, oh, I had this, uh, and on the other part here, I attach to the log device that you find uh, here. This is just uh, like a, like a standard output, so to say, where a trust application can write into, and the user, uh, the the normal world side can actually see what is uh, what is going on. And as you can see, we're fuzzing the the key master trusted application on this device, and it's complaining about a, a bunch of things uh, going wrong in here. And uh, yeah, I was if we look at that. We already found a crash here, which apparently is somewhere when the key master application tries to fetch the, the parameters from this input buffer block. The, there's a, there's, there's a sec fault essentially, and, uh, this seed would be, like, uh, stored away by the fuzzer, of course, and is ready for, um, for triaging and like looking more deeply into it, what uh, kind of corruption we actually found here. All right, that actually worked, I'm surprised. <laughs> So 
So I, I, I actually let this uh, let this run before just in preparation for for this talk because uh, because I wasn't sure if uh, I would actually be able to to get. Oh, I forgot the minus p parameter. So and, uh, in in my hotel room, like five minutes before the talk, I was I was running it and was like, oh, okay, that's going to work. I have like three different crashes in uh, like five minutes. That's that's probably a good a good demo. And yeah, so I need a uh, battery. Do you have a USB Type C charger? Sorry for this emergency. No, my USB Type C is blocked, right? Okay, I'll, I'll just wrap this up. Um, so, in this whole evaluation, we found uh, like 40 unique crashes over four different devices and two proprietary TEs. Um, and we also fuzzed Opti, which is an open source reference implementation. We found 13 previously unknown bugs uh, in there. One of the uh, like interesting bugs, for example, was this one on the Nexus 5X, where after fuzzing the keymaster, you reboot the phone and suddenly the decryption doesn't work. So if you really want to annoy someone, like talk dirty to their keymaster and it will not uh, decrypt their their data uh, partition anymore. It's very annoying because then you need a factory reset. So some anecdotes and conclusions about this. So if you encounter situations where your phone doesn't boot anymore, right, you kind of need to do a state reset. It's very annoying for continuous fuzzing. And uh, unfortunately, I was uh, working with a couple of students back then, and we had this chat bot that would just like inform us about this, state, this uh, phone needs, needs a reset. So thank you, Fab, uh, Fabian and, and Julian, for your patience in this project. That was the state reset version one. Version two was this janky setup where you just like soldered wires to the uh, power button and just uh, orchestrated it from a, from a Raspberry Pi that worked like seem like better. At least it was automated. It was a lot of uh, effort to like kind of interface every phone. The simplest solution was just like this little rig here with a servo motor that just like pushes the power button. <laughs> okay, so and, uh, that, that, that's what we used in the end to do like longer longer fuzzing campaigns. So with this, I'm um, concluding my talk. Uh, this was Tease, uh, state and type aware black box fuzzing for trusted applications. Uh, I gave you an overview. I showed you the results that we saw here. And uh, we have an academic paper if you want to know more about the details. And the code uh, should be on GitHub. If you want to reach out to me, feel free. I'm happy to answer your questions now. Thanks, Marcel. Uh, yes, we have time for questions. Uh, do we have questions in the audience? Please don't be shy. Raise your hand. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Uh, very interesting talk. So how are you um, grabbing state information? I, I mean, in the sense, like, there's this uh, certain APIs that need to be called in a certain order. Are you recording this from uh, actual executions and then messing around yes. uh, with the state? So for, for this key master uh, example here, for example, you can just go to the settings app, let's say, right? And uh, like enroll a new, a new password or something, and you would just intercept uh, this communication while you're doing this enrollment process. And so you... And you're adding to this uh, random state uh, mutations from the functions you know that are uh, that are there. So in in the first step, we're just recording the original normal interaction, right? And then we try to establish the the dependencies between the different transactions, and then we use this as as a seed. So we can basically replay what uh, the original application did, and based on that, we do the mutations. Okay, and one last uh, question. Do you think the approach you've taken uh, would also cover for race conditions? Sorry, I didn't get the last part. Do you think this approach that you've taken would also cover race conditions? Um, race conditions? No. I mean, the, the, the targets here are typically trust applications, and most of the TEs are executed um, single-threaded. Um, so for this domain, I think it's not a problem. Um, 
in general, I mean, this is, this is an approach for like having good seeds, right? And if you have a, a fuzzer that in a parallel way feeds inputs into a parallelly executing target, yeah, that could be uh, a good way if to do this. If it's single threaded, then the only case you have of a race condition if, it, if something was left dirty and then another function used it afterwards. So it's, yes, it's a much simpler scenario. Um, you don't have like two concurrent uh, calls that are being run, you know, on the on the secure on the secure world. Yeah. So it's a simpler scenario. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Uh, do we have any other questions in the audience? All right. If you get questions later, feel free to find Marcel in the somewhere. <laughs> And so let's uh, give the last round of applause for Marcel for today. Thank you.